yours. Deer. Fallow deer. Mountain goats. Mouflon. Friends of the Iberian fauna may wonder where such a zoological paradise can be found today in Spain. In very few places. In a few natural parks, such as this one in Los Cuillo, in the province of Cuenca, where we are now. Today we are presenting one of the episodes dedicated to the wolf in this detailed monograph. Specifically, the episode focuses on its activities as a predator. Therefore, we've started by showing you the wolf's world, the large ungulates that this wild canine preys upon. Naturalists, particularly ecologists, often depict these ecosystems in beautiful geometric drawings they call pyramids of numbers. In our field notebook, we have precisely one of these pyramids, corresponding to the complete Mediterranean forest before it was degraded by humans. Who knows when? 2,000 years ago? At the base of the pyramid are the plants, the only creatures capable of converting solar energy into assimilable energy. Cork oaks, holm oaks, gall oaks, oak trees, pines, strawberry trees, grass. On this tier of producers, the tier of primary consumers, omnivores and herbivores, wild boars, buffaloes, deer, roe deer, the animals you have just seen in the wild, in living images. Above all of them, capitalizing on solar energy through plants and through ungulates, omnivores or herbivores, is the wolf, the apex predator, much like humans are today. And an apex predator has no choice but to kill, to eat. Precisely for this reason, we titled this episode The Most Dramatic, The Most Tremendous, I believe often excessively tremendous, of the wolf, the innocent killers, because it cannot be forgotten that wolves do not kill intentionally. They have no choice but to do so to eat. And it cannot be forgotten either that if we want to make a documentary description of the wolf, even if it's harsh, we must present its aspect as a killer in the ancient and balanced world that corresponded to it as the apex predator of the Mediterranean community. But before presenting the wolf as a predator, it is worth describing a little-known aspect of its ecological characteristics. I am referring to its tendency to necrophagy, feeding on carcasses if it finds them before embarking on a hunt. Wolves, extraordinarily intelligent and knowledgeable about their environment, observe with great care the movements of all creatures that make up their surroundings, particularly vultures. Wolves know very well that the crown of vultures rising each morning over the vulture roosts will end up in a line of prospectors heading in a straight line towards an animal carcass. But the success of wolves as scavengers depends on the distance at which the piece prospected by the vultures is found. The voracity of these winged necrophages is well known. If wolves arrive late, they will find very few remains to satisfy their appetite.
This mutual dependence between terrestrial hunters and winged ghouls is common in all latitudes. In Africa, it can also be found in relation to lions, hyenas, and vultures. The vultures eat very quickly, not only because the wolves might arrive, but also because other congeners would share the prey. The dominance of the wolves over the vultures is perfectly evident in these frames. In this case, the stronger wolves steal the remains of a mouflon from the vultures. And these evidently have to settle for what the powerful predators leave them. Nevertheless, an individual confrontation can be established that will perfectly demonstrate, on the one hand, the dominance of the wolf over the vulture, and on the other hand, the good intentions of the canid. It seems perfectly clear that the wolf was only trying to convince the vulture to let it eat the remains of the mouflon. It could have killed it with its tremendous bite to the skull. However, it has limited itself to gently transporting it downhill. On this occasion, as on many others, Wolves can feed thanks to the long-range vision of the vultures. Thanks to the collaboration of the winged prospectors that help carnivores find dead meat all over the world. But the most beautiful nuance of the wolf as a predator is the team pursuit of any of the animals that serve as prey. From the small bunny to the large deer. A lone wolf is nothing. Wolves live together in society precisely because society facilitates their predation. They are social hunters. In this sequence, it is perfectly evident how wolves help each other in the pursuit of the rabbit. How the paths to the burrow are being cut off. Perfectly comparable to a team of young humans engaged in an athletic match. Just after catching the rabbit, one of the wolves has spotted a large mouflon, an old male mouflon. The encounter will demonstrate, first of all, that wolves have a true preference for large, solitary males of ungulates, generally adult specimens of many years. Secondly, it will allow us to verify, not that the wolf is cowardly, but simply conservative. The lone wolf that has discovered the mouflon waits for the rest of the pack to arrive before undertaking a serious hunt. The wolf would have gained nothing from enduring a blow from the mouflon on its ribs or muzzle. Therefore, the wolf calmly waits for the rest of the pack to arrive. Only then will the killing begin in earnest. The social hunter goes all out when dealing with a swift and resilient prey like the wild boar.
Gradually, the wolves will encircle a prey as fast and perhaps as resistant as the canids themselves, the fallow deer. Without realizing it, the ungulate will fall into the nets set by the superior strategy of the social hunters. Footage in the snow, captured with a large telephoto lens, will allow us to perfectly appreciate the teamwork of the wolves, but in this case, leaving a killer stationed while the rest of the pack drives a mouflon towards the place where the lead wolf is stationed. Without witnessing these cold and objective sequences, one would not believe in the intelligence of wolves. One could not grasp that these canids were executing a hunting system perfectly comparable to what humans must have developed throughout the entire Quaternary period in the flourishing era of the Paleolithic. A whole pack of wolves, led by an old alpha, has positioned themselves precisely above the gorge used by the ungulates to ascend from the valley to the mountain in the cold dawn. A silent and simple exchange of glances allows the wolves to update each other on the situation. There's no need for movements that would date their presence. No howling is necessary. Just a glance, a nod of the head. The group of accomplished strategists has finally spotted at dawn the wild boar ascending after having fed during the night in the fields of the meadows towards the mountains. It must use the gate and now, we will observe perfectly how, while the rest of the pack waits above, in case the boar manages to evade the attack of the leader, this one, alone, descends to hold the prey. Similar to the case of the old mouflon, the dominant wolf will simply hold the boar, distract it, while slowly, convinced that it will not escape the wolf's encirclement, the rest of the pack descends to complete the kill. The wolf tasked with the challenging mission of holding the prey 
in this case as dangerous as the wild boar, seeks to attract the attention of its kin with its tail raised conspicuously visible from afar. The vultures eagerly await the opportunity to join the feast as well. As all naturalists have been able to verify, wolves generally do not finish off the prey they kill. Once they are satisfied, they depart and leave much of the carcass, in this case a significant portion of the wild boar, on the field. In doing so, they favor the vultures, from which they, as we have seen in certain instances, also obtain a source of protein. While the vultures feast on the large wild boar, we can recall some nuances of the wolf as a social predator. It has been verified, not only in these films of ours, unpublished in the Iberian Peninsula, but especially on Isle Royale in North America, that when wolves attack large moose, they also send out a scouting wolf. as in the case of the old mouflon, as in the case of the wild boar. While the rest of the pack waits at the paths the prey would have taken, there is a wolf that faints with them. It has been thought that this wolf may have the mission to allow the rest of the pack to assess the vigor, strength, endurance, even the speed of that prey that is being somehow tempted to decide whether or not to launch a massive attack. The truth is that in all instances where we have been able to film the attack of a wolf pack on a large ungulate, there has always been first a wolf, usually the dominant one of the pack, that has descended to the vicinity of the ungulate to subject it to its harassment, apparently playful, for a while, until the rest of the pack has descended. For many millennia, when man, who was also a social hunter like the wolf, barely intervened in ecological laws, there is no doubt that most of the carcasses found by vultures and other scavengers to feed on were carcasses killed by wolves. Sometimes, especially in winter, the wolves guarded these carcasses and did not or would not allow the vultures and foxes to finish them. In autumn, in spring, more mobile, wolves generally abandon carrion to be finished by scavengers. These scavengers also have their hierarchy in the exploitation of prey. It can be perfectly verified that each of the vultures that have arrived at the carcass occupies the most suitable parts to pierce through the tough skin of the wild boar. And while one of them cleans its beak and the reddened head after plunging it into the thoracic cavity, the rest of the vultures are taking up positions to devour what the wolves have left behind. It seems almost obsessive in our cinematographic descriptions to present to our viewers the fact that nature is a whole. The circumstance that before man altered the ecological balance, 
practically all animals depended on each other. There is a long and fantastic chain that goes from the humble grass to the peak of the vulture, passing in this case through the wild boar and the fang of the wolf. This, my friends, must have been the life of the wolf in the natural zoo community before man profoundly modified the structure of the ecological pyramid. And yes, we return to the ecological pyramid. And now you will understand why I showed you before. This beautiful geometric drawing of ecologists Precisely. Now I fully open the notebook. And we see that alongside the natural ecological pyramid, before being modified by humans, we have placed the anthropogenic ecological pyramid, that is to say, deeply altered by humans. What is displayed before our eyes? In the tier of primary consumers, in the tier of omnivores and herbivores, the aspect has changed entirely. There are no longer wild boars, mouflons, deer, or roe deer, and rabbits. What do we find? Cows, calves, sheep, goats, some rodents, dogs. In other words, humans eradicate nearly all. Primary consumer animals, that is, herbivores, and introduce domesticated animals. They replace spontaneous fauna with anthropogenic fauna. The wolf still occupies the same position, still being the apex predator that needs meat to survive. But there are no longer deer, no more roe deer, no mouflon, nor goats. What must it do if it does not want to die? Consume cows, calves, sheep, goats. In other words, contend with humans. My friends, in this ecological competition, in this substitution of natural communities, by anthropogenic communities, lies the entire drama of the wolf's existence. Here is where the administration will have to take measures. So that on one hand, we do not drive wolves to extinction, and on the other hand, it is not the farmers who bear the burden of us continuing to have wolves. No. In the world of man, the wolf is an outlaw a vile highwayman, a bandit who has been declared war to the death. Certainly, the shepherd, the farmer, has its reasons for pursuing wolves. Certainly, the wolf, the last wolves of Spain, the last wolves of Europe no longer find a quiet land to bring their cubs into the world. Did they not dominate throughout the Palearctic for over 100,000 years? They were the great apex predators, barely over a kilogram of meat per day to live. But man does not give them that meat. War to the death against the wolf. And thus, in every place, in every ecosystem, the wolf flees. It lives where it can. Slowly, relentlessly, its populations dwindling. Any day now, the most beautiful, the most powerful of Europe's carnivores will have entered the trance of extinction. The last of the Spanish wolves will be dead.